Good day to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I'm William Powell, and I'm the natural and editor in chief at Natural Gas World. And this is our new podcast, for which I'm delighted to say we have invited Lewis MacDonald, who is the global head of energy at the law firm Herbert Smith Freehills. Based in London, he has extensive experience of energy law in many jurisdictions, including, of course, Asia, where he worked for many years. We're going to be discussing the new developments in the energy market. On top of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has wiped trillions off the value of companies and slashed upstream spending by maybe a third of this, by a third this year, 30% off, we have a number of problems to deal with collectively. First of all, there is the fact that the global population is set to rise quite fast over the next 30 years, which is the last real investment cycle. So by 2050, we could be looking at a world with maybe 3 billion more people on it. That has a number of very, very serious implications for energy supply. The burgeoning middle class will expect better access to electricity, to heat and power, clean cooking, and everything else that most of the Western world has become used to over the last few decades. That's the first, that's the first thing, it's going to be the rising demand. Second, of course, is the fact that we have this immovable target of 1.5% maximum global warming growth by that year as well. And if that weren't enough, of course, oil and gas reserves, once they're on, they tend to decline. So it's not enough simply to say there's enough oil and gas. We have to keep the oil and gas coming for decades. This presents a number of challenges, and Lewis will be discussing these with us as we turn to the questions of financing, law, and how and how the uh, the money can be raised to fund these projects. First of all, uh, Lewis, looking at the, uh, the big question which has arisen over the last couple of years with increasing intensity, I think it's true to say, is the environmental social governance agenda, which has shot to the top of a number of companies, uh, if you like, transformation plans. These range from the relatively humdrum and cosmetic, such as London Petroleum, calling it itself now London, to the far more serious upheavals at the majors, such as BP, of which we'll be hearing more uh, in September. First of all, though, on, on ESG, there's an impression that it's mainly affecting the uh, companies active in the European markets and less so in Asia. Would you think that is a, a fair uh, assessment? And do you think that funding is going to be easier in different parts of the world from the European Union? As you know, the EIB announced plans to withhold funding for uh, fossil fuel projects post-2021. Lewis. Yeah, thanks, William. Um, look, and thanks for orienting um, the discussion as you did at the start. Um, I think it's good to point out some of those statistics as you have around population, uh, rising standards of living, um, and also the climate goals, because I think they do orient the, the discussion in a way that's that's important to remember. Um, in relation to ESG, um, obviously, I suppose prior to COVID, that was really the major issue um, being discussed in the boardrooms of the major oil and gas companies and the banks and private equity funding um, funding the companies. And um, of course, we've seen a shift over the last few months, but still, it's very much on the agenda. And, you know, we've seen the companies uh, redoubling their commitments uh, and their efforts in relation to ESG. So it's certainly not a flash in the pan. It's certainly not going away. Um, just some context about me. I mean, William, you said I was based in Asia for a while. Um, so I'm, my accent is a Perth accent. Um, very much an oil and gas town, or let's say an energy town these days. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> undoubtedly. And um, I, I moved to London about 15 years ago and had around four years in London. And then I moved out to Asia, had time in Singapore for four and a half years, then in Korea, then in Japan, and I actually moved back to London last year. So that gave me an interesting couple of comparisons around maybe how these things are looked at in the different markets. So actually, when I was in London, uh, leaving in 2008, um, just around the time of the GFC, coincidence, I guarantee it, um, I was involved in some of the carbon capture and storage in, in the UK. So um, I was helping um, a BP with its investment with Rio Tinto into hydrogen energy. If you remember back then, mm -hmm. they, they were very hard at carbon capture and storage investments and also involved yeah, with yeah. Central when they invested into progressive energy 
is looking at an 800 megawatt clean coal um, uh, project on Teesside. And having been involved in those transactions, and then I was involved in um, British Gas, as it then was, their first coal seam gas investment was in the UK, it wasn't in Queensland. Um, and then I moved out to Asia, and I noticed a real, a real difference at that point even between those types of um, investments in, the, in Europe and what was happening in Asia. And in Asia, that was a long way away, you know, that type of, that type of um, activity, that type of project. In fact, out in Asia at that point, it was uh, the stuff we were getting in, involved in was um, non-core asset divestments uh, during the, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the dip in the economy that we saw with the global financial crisis. So just to emphasise the cycles and how they, how they go. And over the course of that, the 10 years I had in Asia, um, of course, um, investment in renewables increased, um, but still it's, but it's nowhere near where it's at in Europe. Then returning to Europe last year, uh, having been in Korea, Japan, as I said, I really noticed the difference in emphasis on ESG. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely palpable, you know, in dealing with the European companies, mm -hmm. the Asian companies. Um, look, I guess it's been, it, it's very much um, a, a, a part of the energy markets in Europe, much more so than in Asia. Although, as I said, Asian uh, energy policies are changing and they are um, uh, sort of bringing more renewables into the mix and becoming more and more aware of climate change issues as, as standards of living uh, rise across developing Asia. Um, but it, there's some way to go to, to catch up. Um, let's face it as well, there has been a serious uptick in the awareness and concern in relation to climate change and ESG more broadly over the last 12 months. We've all seen a, a big social change um, and, and there has been that to some extent in Asia as well. But William, in terms of the chilling effect on investment, I think um, that's certainly something that we're seeing in relation to fossil fuels. You know, um, there's that statistic around how many financial institutions are no, are no longer willing to invest in fossil fuels or are divesting. You know, it's something, I think the latest is around 1,200 institutions controlling more than $14 trillion in capital um, have said that they are divesting or they don't want to invest in, in fossil fuels, which is an incredible, an incredible number of institutions, it's an incredible amount of money. Um, and that's them doing that voluntarily, if, if you like, um, based on there's consumer demand and consumer sentiment and maybe an expectation of where laws will go. In the future. You know, there's this notion of the inevitable policy response to climate change and broader social issues and what that's going to mean from a regulatory point of view. And to some extent, this money's coming off the table in advance of that. Um, you know, you've got the disclosure requirements on companies which make uh, directors very nervous in terms of their... Yes. Um, this, uh, their responsibilities. You've got banks being more reluctant to lend. You mentioned the EIB, you know, Europe's major infrastructure funding bank, uh, deciding it doesn't want to invest anymore in non-abated gas fired power, let alone coal. Um, and then you've got the oil and gas companies themselves and their own willingness to invest in oil and gas. You know, you mentioned yes. the they have and, and really that's largely about pushing into being more broadly based energy companies, focusing on yeah. power power and to some extent decarbonisation. So I think as it stands at the moment, we have seen rather a chilling effect on, on investment in, in the sector. Where, where it goes from here, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let's see. Well, of course, this isn't the first time there's been a problem, although this is possibly one of the biggest magnitude. But you, you recall back to 2008 and of course in 2014 as well, the oil price then fell very, very low. Now, that was a trigger for a lot of small PE-backed companies, uh, such as, well, Crystal, for example, and Neptune to plunge in. And they were expecting by now, I think, to be ready to spin their companies off to somebody else. Uh, but of course, those, those the investors don't seem to be there. How do you think they're going to manage their own businesses, given that their business model of six years ago has been overtaken by events? Yeah. Well, as you say, William, you know, last time around, if you like, the PE companies came to the rescue to some extent and um, yeah. decided that was the time to get in and uh, accumulate portfolios of assets uh, with a view to exit, as they normally do. Of course, now they're having to have a look at those strategies and think about whether a buy and hold strategy is more realistic, maybe operating a bit more like a traditional um, oil and gas yes. player, where that is effectively the strategy of um, major oil and gas companies. Um, you know, that's not to say that the IPO market won't return at some point in the future, but right now, of course, 
um, you know, you'd struggle with an IPO um, in, in that scenario. So I think um, the prospects of those private equity companies, if you like, en masse, uh, raising additional funds and, and coming into the market, it, it's, it's, it's a slim prospect. However, if they've already raised the fund, or they've gone out and raised a special purpose vehicle, you know, as we know, Blackstone has, and you've got other um, yeah. already raised the fund, they will have a strong incentive to spend that money because it's been raised. Once it's raised, um, the portfolio company is entitled to spend it. It's, it's very hard for a funder to renege on a commitment in the private equity structure. Right. But once the money's been mm -hmm. raised over the period of time, and of course, those who are um, uh, controlling, if you like, those equity commitments, they will want to spend. So you will see some private equity investment to the extent funds have been raised, raising new money, that's hard. Um, and, and another point there, maybe the, the maybe the way that, uh, if, you, if you like, that kind of money is is raised and the purpose of it, maybe we spent a bit differently, you know. So you'll have to look to the upstream uh, in the traditional sense of owning upstream assets and then there's the possibility of raising it to, if you like, contribute to the capital of the upstream companies in a different way. And we can talk further about that if, if you like. No, I think in this interesting area because infrastructure is one area, and I think where one area where law firms can come in and be creative is is spreading value across the, the, the chain from production to uh, the transport. There's been a number of deals involving pipelines, involving energy capacity, where the holder seems to sell them off, but then lease it back. So the money gets spread across more more companies, enriching more people. I hope. <laughs> Yeah, perhaps an efficient allocation of capital, if you like. But we are seeing that. Yes. I mean, just this week, you've had Adnoc announcing its very large transaction. I think it's the biggest infrastructure deal of the year. It was announced, I think, three days ago, over 20 billion US dollars um, from mm. six funds, um, including, you know, some of the major funds in the world, the uh, Brookfield, uh, GIC of Singapore, um, one of the Canadian pension funds is there as well. And they've effectively mm. put a transaction together with Adnoc which provides Adnoc with that money, you know, in exchange for a payment stream over time. Um, but fundamentally involving the pipeline system that Adnoc owns. So it's a very creative transaction. That's you know, a fantastic, yeah, that's, that's also a fantastic virtue confidence, isn't it, really? It, it shows that there's still, despite what we read, there's still going to be huge amounts of demand for oil and gas. I mean, that, that's sort of, that is writ large, really, that cat's pipeline deal in the UK or the 40s deal. It's all about how do you get huge amounts of money over the very long term and allocate it. And, and this seems to be yeah. the way well, forward. I think that's right. I think it is a vote of confidence in the sector because, of course, that money has to be paid over, a, you know, a, a period of time, you know. Let's say, you know, it'll be... Mm. It'll be decades but um and it's not a you know with those types of investments there's more of them on the horizon you know um shell is looking to structure a similar type of transaction in queensland in relation to the yes. design, lng yeah. uh, asset and you'll see these coming more and more on stream because there's a large demand for them uh, from the infrastructure mm. funds you know there's trillions yes. there with the infrastructure funds and like, as I've said, it's difficult to raise that money and apply it to the upstream directly with upstream yeah. exposure. It's less difficult to contribute that money in a way where the, um, the, the exposure is to the credit worthiness of the entities that are on the other side of the transaction. Because these are, you know, in the ad hoc world, very credit worthy parties. And if, and if a very credit worthy party is willing to um, commit to you to make payments over a period of time, you know, with the appropriate uh, protections in place, so safe investment, you know, um, well, at least commensurate with the rate of return that you're going to enjoy. But those types of investments, because the rate of return can be lower than the rate of return you yes. require for an investment, then yeah. you can have more. Yes. And so they're, 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 they're quite effective. And I think we're going to see more and more of this. And again, link it back to the, um, the sort of general back turning of much of the financial world on oil and gas companies. Um, not to say they've completely done that, but there is a there is a shift, there is a, a trend, if you will. Um, mm. And now we've got the infrastructure funds that are very cashed up and looking looking yes. to deploy capital in a major way 
very willing to, to come forward. And you'll, I think you'll see that these asset sales or these transactions will have a lot of demand. And you, in many cases, think, capital cost of capital shootout is often what it's referred to as. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting phrase. I mean, we began seeing this uh, in Britain or Europe, I should say, probably about 15 or so years ago when I think it was in the interconnected pipeline, uh, a large number of grids in, in Germany and Europe generally. They were bought out by pension funds, teachers, pension, yeah. you know, very, very boring, I might say, uh, widows and orphans type things where they need only five or six percent return. That's all they're looking for. And it's the utility rate of return, basically, isn't it? It's not really the big cash thing. It used to be like when BP in the 40s pipeline, you know, this is much now, much more now boring, predictable, stable, long term. People know there's going to be demand for gas or oil in this case. They can see that there's going to be regular, regular payments. It's also partly regulated, uh, it's, you can't really get that far wrong. You know, European security supply depends on it working. So arguably it's, it's, it's safe as houses. Yeah, arguably, but trust me, a lot of time is spent to, to make sure that it is. It's never quite as simple as it. And um, there's, of course, there's yeah. tension between the buyer and the seller, whereas the seller yeah. wants to expose as little as possible of their broader business to the buyer. Yes. The buyer wants the safest possible transaction. Because if it gets too safe, well, it's very similar to corporate finance and should be uh, priced mm. accordingly. But as it gets closer and closer to the relevant assets that are the subject of the sort of, as you said, sale and lease back, inverted commas, for those who can't see, yeah. um, you know, the rate of return is going to go up, the risk is going to go up. So there's a balance. And all of these are yeah. different. And one other thing to mention is from the perspective of the um, the upstream owner, and maybe why these haven't been done so much in the past when in relation to upstream, because, you know, you mentioned some midstream transactions there yes you've got to be careful you don't lose control you know you need control of the mm -hmm. asset and the state requires that you have control of those assets given the nature of hydrocarbon licensing so yeah. you know, there, there are limitations on these things and we should never we should not think they're easy they're not they're highly structured yeah no, I think I think there's a risk as well there because as, as companies like, for example, Shell, Exxon, BP, they used to own most of the pipelines in Europe, the oil producers, Mobil, and so on. And for them, you know, it's all kind of a monopoly rent. The danger, I think, for you know, for, for gas in Europe is that as these companies simply reduce or go back to selling LNG at the terminal, who is going to be responsible for developing infrastructure downstream and making sure that gas reaches as far as possibly can. I think unbundling was good in many respects, but there, there could possibly be limits on how far companies will, will be interested in selling their gas to Europe if they can't control the delivery beyond the terminal. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's a risk? Or? I think mm -hmm. they're willing. I mean, that you have to look at the underlying fundamentals in these markets. Yeah. And often with the um, infrastructure investments of that nature, um, you know, sometimes there's to the extent there's a necessity for, you know, the market to be supported, you know, some of the pipelines obviously regulated with the regulated asset based mm -hmm. model, which controls yes. uh, what you can charge. Um, you know, and you, you basically bid on the rate of return to set that charge. Um, that usually means you can recover your investment, but you know, so, so long as there's a demand for the and, and depending on how you've structured your arrangement. So, so again, as long as these things are structured right, um, then you know they're safe investments. You know, depend. You know, of course, depending on the terms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how you protect yourselves against changes of law, of course. Yeah. But there's a lot of demand for that type of investment. There's a lot of money out there that is very, very keen on that type of investment. And so I think from, and and it, it maybe raises a broader point about how do you structure investments? What role does government play in terms of taking? Um, the industry into a, a new direction, if you like, as we look forward yeah. to hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, et cetera. I think that's a critical thing, really, it is also, you know, regulatory risk. Um, obviously, yes. There are two questions now. We have to invest in the future. We have to ensure that CCS works. I guess we have to ensure that. But what about what about things like, you know, people who invested in good faith 15, 20 years ago, 10 years ago in CCGTs, not knowing that we'll be having hot days in July where you have negative prices. I mean, these weren't the kinds of things that people could expect to prepare for, really, were they? This is a huge amount of uh, uncertainty, which yeah. must have some yeah. effects on investors. 
So how, how, how does a law firm go about <laughs> reassuring people that the money is well spent? Yeah, well, obviously we don't the laws unless we go into politics, some lawyers do. Um, <laughs> it's really about helping investors understand um, the protection yeah, that yeah. Against those changes. I guess yeah. as time's gone by, you've seen what's happened in Europe. And so when you're investing in other markets that might be behind Europe, you might have some understanding of what could happen in those markets. I mean, and if, if you're investing, say, in... Um, uh, say a CCGT in a developing country or some other country, um, you know, you might try to protect yourself in your concession agreement against changes of law. Um, you might mm -hmm. influence the PPA um, and to what extent mm -hmm. you're paying for the capacity, you know, just for being yes. in operation as opposed to the throughput. Yeah. So, you know, as a lawyer, we have to help the clients understand all of those risks and, we, you know, we yes. do a of markets, so we are supposed to try to foresee these, you know, contemplatable risks and, and build, build the protection as necessary. So at least you know what risks you're taking, what risks you're not taking. Um, I suppose interesting mm. there as well, you know, you've had the CCGTs in Europe, and you might say, well, they've suffered at the hands of the subsidisation of the, the renewable industry. But I, I suppose going forward, it might be that the CCGTs have to be subsidised to get into uh, blue hydrogen and things like that. Which may affect the renewables industry. So it all yeah, comes in. Let's, <laughs> let's hope. Let's hope. The, let's hope the boot eventually ends up on the other foot. At least, at least some of the time. <laughs> how, how do you think um, CCS or uh, well, the CCS in particular is an extremely expensive uh, project development. Uh, hydrogen. He mentioned that as well. Governments seem to be calling most of the shots, lobbied by either side of the uh, the green agenda. So how do you again? How do you see investments being being encouraged into that? And do you even think it's a market anymore, or is it a series of uh, very very carefully calculated balances so that nobody actually makes much money? But Europe meets its targets, uh, and carbon emissions are uh, yeah. limited. I have to unpack that a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't know. I know, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I think take a bit by bit, bit if you want. Take a bit by bit. Yeah, that's where these things are markets. I think you know. Obviously, energy is such a sensitive political topic, as well as being yeah. a major commercial endeavour. And so, mm. to encourage participation in that in those markets, in order to get competitive pricing, um, you know, the, the governments need to solve some of the you know, some of the issues with the markets. I mean, some, unless there's sufficient policy support for some types of investment in some locations, they're not investable. Um, mm -hmm. Unless externalities are properly brought into the market, like carbon dioxide emissions and the damage they cause, um, that also, you know, will favour some types of investments over others. So I think energy markets are classic markets where you need policy intervention until such point as, you know, there's a level playing field. And you've seen that with the subsidisation of renewables um, over time. Mm -hmm. But what they've done in Europe and the United States in particular is it's enabled the um, you know, enabled the deployment at a large scale of different renewable technologies, which have brought the cost down. Yes, meaning that they're now competitive, and in many cases, some you know with some solar even cheaper, some wind as well. So the subsidisation of the market uh, enables the introduction of the new technologies. And there's a very interesting parallel yes. with that and the current state of affairs with blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. Mm. Because what's effectively happening at the European level, in this sort of current process, as I understand it, there's a sort of a, a picking of the winner seems to be going on between blue and green. And there's a lot of debate um, at the European policy and legislative level around whether they should be favouring, you know, green over blue. Of course, green being the step forward straight to basically you know, or yeah, taking hydrogen out of water, taking mm. hydrogen out of water mm. which is an energy negative equation but if you use renewable energy abundant renewable energy to do it and there's no other use for renewable energy then maybe it works but it won't be viable mm. for, you know, for some time but i think the role of the government here is to create the environment where these different technologies can be uh experimented with if you like so that yes. over time the, the cheaper can prevail in order that you can actually decarbonise the fossil fuels, or over time um, phase phase them out, but over a period of time that actually enables the technology to develop in an efficient way. And I think mm. that's something where maybe there's some issues right now in the world, William, around the fact that 
there's a sentiment around this switching all the fossil fuels off, you know, and going straight into renewables. And why do we need fossil fuels if solar is cheap? Yeah. And there are some realities that they have to grip, right? Yeah. This is what concerns me really is the, is the apparent refusal to accept that the world still needs an awful lot. Not just to re not just to meet growing demand, but to replace declines. And the yeah. idea that some NGOs are saying that this is brilliant that BP is restructuring because it recognises there's no more place for oil and gas, but that, that simply isn't true. And I think I think the public has become a little bit, if you like, uncritical of, of some of the stories they're being told. Yeah, they're almost being yeah. The response coming from some corporates and maybe the industry at large is almost designed to match um the level of sophistication of the criticism and i yeah. think that's dangerous you know like you said at the very start with the stats you quoted from the iea there are some hardwired realities here around population prosperity yeah uh, and emissions and you know yeah. there's a lot of money there's a lot of oil and gas needed in the system um to enable the world uh world's population to have enough energy to live the prosperous lives that they should expect and uh, if we switch off fossil fuel investment, all those people won't get um, the standard of living. They they won't they won't enjoy the benefits of economic development because you won't be yeah. able to, unless there's a real step change in technology that we haven't currently understood. Uh, you won't be able to develop the solar and wind quick enough. But even with exponential increase in those technologies, you still need to maintain the fossil fuels in the system, which means you need to decarbonise it. Which means you need to allocate more money to those um, to those existing technologies. And I know that's politically unpopular, but you know well, that's yeah, just money is important supply. Now we're the facts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, money is in very short supply at the moment, and the the boring we're having to do or the the uh, quantitative easing which is being which is being carried out must at some point come home to roost. And I think householders are going to have less money to spend on nice ideas. I think it's all come at the you know, obviously Kevin is, is it never come at the right time, <laughs> but the coincidence of that and everything else has, has really has I think exposed a lot of money to a lot of risk, which before was if you like yeah, not anyone's yeah. agenda. Yeah. Well, like I said, there's yeah, still a lot of money. The infrastructure funds still have plenty of money. Yes, that's true. And there's a yes. role for government. There's a role for government to create the business models to attract that money in such that over time costs can come down to make it all effective and i don't think there's really any way around that unfortunately and i think that reality will be whether that reality is felt in the next price spike of um gas prices or whether it's felt today you know that's someone someone else needs to work that out i think thank you joe have any questions come in from uh, the great outside uh well lewis you were talking uh, about hey, um viewers. Uh, yeah, Lewis, you were Sorry. talking about this uh, battle going on between uh, blue and, and green hi hydrogen and um, the importance of having uh, an open door to all of the technologies so that you can end up with the uh, you know, lowest cost, most feasible uh, solution for, for hydrogen energy. Um, and this, this is a choice that Germany has had to, had to make recently and they, they just adopted, as, you, as you'll know, a new hydrogen strategy where they're only supporting green hydrogen um, and you know the, the gas industry is naturally quite 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 peeved about this because uh, they want to play a role in this in in this uh, transition and it, it feels like a lost opportunity uh, given you know Germany being the biggest gas market in Europe right now uh, having all of this import infrastructure, I mean, you've got the, the Russian gas coming in, Norwegian gas, uh, they're building new LNG terminals, possibly, um, Nord Stream 2 about to come online. It, you know, it feels like a lost lost opportunity, really. Uh, just wondered what your your thoughts on mm. that, that situation are. Yeah, I mean, look, of course, it's good that um, Germany wants to lead on, on that technology, because you see in the long term, of, of course, you know, green hydrogen, you know, if you look, really look forward, that's the direction to travel. But it does feel like you need to go through that interim step, um, partly to um, ensure, you know, that the, the, maybe the quick up, uptake of the um, hydrogen in the systems, because, uh, you know, obviously multiple countries can go down the blue hydrogen route. Um, 
you know, but also perhaps to some extent to protect existing investments. As long as the um, existing blue hydrogen can be, the CO2 can be stored, you know, and that's obviously the difference between blue and green. One of the major differences is you have to have carbon capture and storage um, for, for blue. Then it, it should be something that's supported, I, I think. And I'm, I'm sure um, in countries where they have maybe more of a domestic industry, maybe the United Kingdom being a good example, you can see that they may be more inclined to go down a route that maybe preserves both options um, and, and particularly, you know, protects the, um, the opportunity for, for blue hydrogen. So I think the North Sea assets and all the investment that's been made there, um, you know, would be would be well supported by a, a blue hydrogen regime. So it's interesting that at the EU level it hasn't been decided and the EU taxonomy uh, would at this moment support either form because it doesn't it doesn't um, specify beyond saying that your gas-fired power would need to not exceed 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. It doesn't specify the technology. So the EU taxonomy, interestingly, does not pick a winner, even if Germany has. Mm. It's interesting. Very interesting. And um, you were, uh, we were also talking about this, um, these regulatory risks, and uh, Europe is very much at the forefront of this, um, some a antipathy towards towards upstream uh, development. Um, and one big example you had last year was um, Ireland uh, banning uh, offshore oil exploration, uh, which left a few companies in in the lurch. I mean, how, how big a risk do moves like that pose to European upstream right now? Um, and what, what sort of um, legal recourse might uh, investors have uh, if to deal with this, you know, to deal with um, investments they, they've made, are making, um, potentially becoming worth a lot less or, or even worthless? Yeah, yeah. No, look, it's one of the bigger risks facing oil and gas companies today, right? If you executives from oil and gas companies will, will say that, um, you know, the idea of a, a, a even a democratic country deciding they don't want um, this type of production anymore, it can be a very popular thing to do by a government to say, well, we're going to stop it. It's a good signal, right? It's a virtuous signal of some, yeah, in some way. Yeah. Say, well, we're not going to participate in this. But let's, you know, the, the, again, going right back to the start, you know, if you look at the issue at the broadest level, you need to see it as a transition over time. And so I don't know how helpful mm. um, those types of decisions are in the end, whether they really contribute to the problem. I mean, maybe something that could be done is that you focus on leading the decarbonisation effort. So again, you go to your Germany example, that's going to help the world a lot, right? Maybe they haven't chosen the right way of doing it, but if they want to leap for 20 years into the future and start paying for that, technology upgrade of course they're going to make sure their companies have the ip to it as you'd expect unless unless other governments want to get involved and share it but that's constructive i think because that's really going to the heart of the issue i think banning it is is, is difficult because again you can't just switch to the not ready to switch um yeah. what can you do about it well it depends where you invest and how you invested you know you've got to look very carefully at um the terms these days um there are a lot of bilateral investment treaties you can take advantage of you know, and I don't want this to turn into a boring legal treatise, but you know, oh, there I mean, are things interesting. Depending on what you invest, the nature of the um, the uh, intergovernmental relations between the the country of the um, investing company and the the country you're investing in too, you can structure your investments in a way where you can, let's say, at least maximise your protection against those things, against these major changes in the law. And you've got to look at those things these days. Uh, you know, you talked mm -hmm. about. Um, subsidised energy, renewable energy or whatever coming into the fray and you mentioned now cancellation of um, <laughs> or bad, um, hydrocarbon activity and, and you have to look at that these days when you're making your investments, you have to. Yeah, it's all part of the risk isn't it really, I guess as life goes on and there's always going to be uncertainties and you can't make a guaranteed or tight contract, just make sure that any risks are uh, reasonably protected and you get reimbursed for any problems. I think yeah, a lot of those coming up recent now, aren't there, with the force majeure claims and the uh, in the COVID nineteen energy problems. But that's a problem for another day, I think. I shan't tax it now. 
Yeah. We've seen plenty of those in the last three months. I'll tell you that we've seen we've seen it from all angles. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> right, I think that kind of uh, brings us to an end. Unless there's anything, Lewis, we haven't discussed that you think is worth uh, an aside, or uh, if not, then I would like to uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Joe. I, I'm William Powell. I'm the uh, editor in chief of Natural Gas Well, as I may have said. It's been great. And I hope you listening to it in your offices elsewhere, in your homes, you've also found this useful. Many thanks to everybody for vlogging on and for taking the time to listen. Um, and I'm sure this will be available to download later on at some point. But for now, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the weekend, or if this is next week, I hope you had a good one last week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.